introduce our first speakers today. Um, it's an honor for me to introduce Dan Whitaker and Wesley Rhodes. Uh, they're going to talk about the transformation to intelligent enterprise. Dan Whitaker focused on innovation and transformation at, Kro at Kroger um, um, and, and its enterprise approaches to data analytics, architecture, technology strategies and practices, as well as its disruption roadmap. He served as the CTO and Vice President of Business Development for a technology services organization and spent six years consulting at IBM on, on information and analytics strategy and architecture. Wesley Rhodes is the VP of R&D and Transformation for Kroger Technology and Digital. He holds academic appointments in cybersecurity, health informatics, supercomputing applications, and advanced R&D research. Rhodes has advanced degrees in business and technology from the University of Houston, the University of Western Carolina, UT at Austin, and from the University of Maryland. So, Dan, thank you for, for being with us today. We truly look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Jose. I appreciate you inviting us. And, and I was able to tune in in some of the presentations yesterday. It was, it's, looks like it's a very good uh, webinar so far. And I appreciate the sponsors helping you put this on. So thanks to everyone. Uh, today, I hope I have to start showing the application. Today, Wes Rhodes and I want to talk a little bit about the intelligent en enterprise in cognitive and context computing. But before I do that, since this is this is a, a, an audience from around the world, both Wes and I are currently working for Kroger. You may not know who Kroger is, so just for a little bit of background on Kroger, Kroger is probably is the largest traditional grocery store in the U.S. On the Fortune 500 scale, we come in at number 20, 20th largest company in the U.S. Uh, we have about $120 billion worth of sales every year, and we serve about over 11 million customers every single day. So, the intelligent enterprise, cognitive and context computing, or the rise of the sense-making machine. We use this term sense-making machine, and actually I've seen it in publications much more often anymore, is how, what is it? our ability to acquire data and to make sense out of it and to test our assumptions over and over and over again. Uh, we have to do this at, in a time that allows us to act relevantly. At this point, I would typically play, play a video, but as in many presentations, the video works everything all the way up to the time of the presentation and now it doesn't work. So let me, let me just, let me ask you to imagine this, if you would. Imagine you're standing on the corner of a very, very busy intersection and cars are whipping by very quickly and you need to get to the other side of the intersection. But the only information that you have is a snapshot or a photo that you took five minutes ago. How would you cross the street? Well, this is the way many corporations are working today is they're looking into the past to decide what to do now. But as we think of the new competitive reality, the most competitive organizations are the ones that are going to acquire data to learn and act as fast as they learn. That is what is going to be very important. Now you may ask, why does a grocery store care about that? What, why does retail care about that? But if, if, you've, if you've been in this industry, you realize we are going through a great deal of transformation ourselves. Personalization for every single consumer, endless aisles, the change from consumers wanting things a day from now to seconds from now, uh, the ability to take the platforms that we have and monetize them, monetize them, meaning I have to change very quickly to adjust to consumer behaviors. The need for fresh and local food requires that I keep up-to-date information on what's available at all times. Moving from products to services now that I really have to understand how a customer acts as much as what products do they want. So data and science is becoming very important to everything we do, but it's not just data and science, it's fast data and science. So making the new competitive reality a reality, it's actually, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. We really don't have time to go through all these pieces, uh, 
this moment, but we're going to touch on a couple of them. The po important points that we would like to talk about today is managing data as an asset, mastering cognitive and context computing, uh, engineering a systems of systems approach, and understanding the principles of duality. So I'm going to touch on the data part, and then I'm going to pass the baton to Wes, who will talk more on the cognitive and the systems of systems engineering portion. So why does data matter? Data is the language of business. This is how systems and people communicate with each other. If the data, if the language of data is not consistent throughout an organization, it causes problems. Let me give you an example. A single decision up in one of our manufacturing facilities may say, I want to ship ketchup. I no longer want to ship ketchup in glass bottles, but I want to ship it in plastic bottles. When someone makes a decision like that, the weight of a case of ketchup goes from 30 pounds to 20 pounds. So, okay, why is that important? Well, when I'm shipping ketchup from a manufacturing plant to a distribution center, if the case weight is 30 pounds, I quickly reach the weight capacity of the truck before I ever reach the space or cube capacity of the truck. So I ship, the truck half empty because that's all I can put on it. When the case weight goes to 20 pounds, now I can fit much more on that truck. But if my warehouse and my logistics team doesn't know it now weighs 20 pounds, they'll still load the truck as if it was 30 pounds per case. Therefore, I'm shipping air when I don't need to do that. That problem will go all the way through the supply chain to the point where I wanna put product on the shelf in the store and now the width of a consumer item was two inches. It is now three inches, and I no longer can fit the same number of product on the store. So data is a foundation for science, cognitive, and context. The other thing that we try to make a point of is data management. And the point that data management is not something that is done by application by application, Rather, data management spans application and has to be done holistically. So let me give you an example of that. So I might develop a pricing system. And in that pricing system, since I'm a retailer, I'm going to assume everything needs a price. If I'm going to sell it, it needs a price. So I'll put that rule into the system or someone would do that. However, the people that set up the item setup system or develop those programs know that's a very complex problem and they don't have all the information when they set up an item, so they may not have the price yet. But since the previous system required a price, they decided to implement a rule that says, I'll enter 99 cents and that will indicate I need a price. However, the people downstream at the point of sale system doesn't know that rule exists. So they assume the chicken or the product is 99 cents and they'll sell it for 99 cents. So if I'm selling $8 chicken for 99 cents, I sell a lot of chicken, but I don't necessarily make money on it. So it's important to understand the rules across every application on how we manage data. The big problem we're trying to solve from a data perspective is this thing we call enterprise amnesia. I've been in the business for a little bit since the 80s. And back in the 80s, it was very easy to manage data because Storage was so expensive. We had to be very careful of everything we store. We, it, we were so careful we stored two digits for a year rather than four digits. If you're around for year 2K, you know the problem that caused. How, over, however, over time, technology has changed and storage has gotten much cheaper. So now everyone can have their own copy of data, but it's really not a copy of data, it's a version of data because everyone changes it to their use. So what is happening now is data volume and redundancy is growing fantastically, but the understanding of what data we have, where it's at, and if it's fit for use is plummeting. So this huge gap is being created called enterprise amnesia, and we have to solve the amnesia problem if we're going to make the most effective use of our data. I'm going to pass the baton over here to Wes and let him go through connective cognitive and contextual computing. Wes? Coming. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. All right, I'm gonna go fast. So we're gonna try and make this worth your while by packing in a lot of information. 
Now, the intelligent enterprise is really all about getting a lot of data that matters, figuring out quickly what that data is trying to tell you, then quickly detecting the most advantageous thing to do. A computer can add, we know that. It can tell us binary black and white answers. But what if we want more? Is this bottom line of 2.25 plus 2.25 4 or 5? Can the computer reason? And I'm trying to advance this. Let's try it again. There we go. Well, you know, it all depends. The it depends, depends on what? It depends on things that are not evident here. It's something that's happened earlier. It's the context. The context is yet more data we must understand and correlate to this event. And this event has not, this data has not been considered yet. So what do we do? Well, this is when our thoughts turn back to Alan Turing and his Turing test. You know that imitation game movie? Can the interior interrogator tell the difference between an answer from a person and a computer? When we get into com to the complex, we need new ways to simplify the complexity through systems of systems approaches, new frameworks and abstractions. This is what Alan Turing was doing when he posed the questions to form the discussions on the first principles of the field. Does a computer think? Does a computer perceive? Now, we know there are many disciplines. Now there's frameworks and abstractions and advanced technologies we must consider and integrate to achieve an intelligent enterprise. Now, there's not time to talk about all of those right now. So for today, we'll just assume that a computer thinks in terms of math and perceives the current situation within the scope of available current data. The computer perceives concepts through the accumulation and correlation of data over time, then associates that data appropriately to the current observations to make highly ac accurate identification or predictions. So let's look at the basics of context accumulation. Let's think about context as a puzzle piece. So here's a puzzle piece. It has flames on it. So what does it mean? Anybody know? I doubt it. So let me give you some context. Let's say that this uh, puzzle piece belongs in a fireplace. Well, great. It's going to be a great day. Get a snack, relax, sit in your park, sit in your favorite chair, get a blanket. It's going to be a great day. But what if that puzzle piece was on a house? Now you have an emergency. Call 911. But what if that house was on a frame and was hanging on your wall? Well, now it's art. So there you go. It's something to be admired. So you can see the definition of context on your screen. By taking into account all the relevant facts that became a piece of data that you're considering, that's the context. All these prior fa facts are the context. So let's go a little bit further. Let's switch gears to cognitive computing. Machine language is the adaptive learning component of AI, while cognitive is the thinking and orchestration components, with orchestration components. We know from the previous slide that what cognitive uh, thinks on is the data it's presented with. If I'm building a cognitive system for situational awareness, uh, that will react to, you know, dynamically changing conditions, I need a closed loop system that will understand and perceive the conditions quickly. You know, respond and learn, do it again and again. To do that, we need a closed loop system. If we put this all together, we end up with an AI model that looks like what I've got on the screen here. The closed loop list system that I've used in the diagram is an OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, enact. That was developed by John Boyd in the 1950s. Now, he was an Air Force colonel who developed it to describe air combat operations processes. It explains how to direct one's energies to defeat an adversary in combat and survive. Now, he was a pilot. You know, it's a set of interacting feedback loops, you know, that are kept in continuous operation during combat. So just think of it as a dogfight. When I worked for IBM as the deputy CTO for US Federal and NATO, 
I worked with the Air Force and then later U.S. Cybercom to adapt this same method, this clo closed loop system to set up the U.S. Cyber Defense Framework and it worked perfectly. These principles of thinking about the environment are applicable to logistics, digital business, or any other competitive, responsive business problem. To win, you must do these things better than your competitor. You must observe your relevant environment better than your competitor. Knowledge is power, and it all starts with gathering the raw information from which decisions and actions are based on. You must orient the information to prepare it for decision making. This is where data context plays a major role if you were accumulating by accumulating these facts from the past and correlating, associating with other data elements properly and then connecting them to the situation correctly. This is also where simulation, prediction, unwanted bias uh, nullification, uh, past experience, risk bias, corporate culture and values are also considered. Then you must decide and act within a time frame that matters. You know, what is a time frame that matters? That's your window of opportunity. To win, you must continuously do this faster than your competitors. You must operate at a faster tempo to generate, you know, to tempo to generate rapidly changing conditions that inhibit your opponent from adapting more quickly than you are. This cognitive learning model is built for decision clarity. Then it's optimized for speed. The orient step is where many fall down. So let's take a quick look at situational awareness from a sense and respond point of view. This is a system of systems approach. So this is a kind of a nugget, a small uh, cognitive uh, um, model, a modelette. This example cognitive model, it has certain responsibilities. Some of it will, it will take action on. Some it will pass to humans for action. Some it will pass to other systems, other cognitive systems for action, or it'll pass it to them as context to accumulate for other considerations. Input comes from many IoT sensors in a store that count, smell, see, hear, detect, water, determine if a door is open or closed, feel heat or cold, etc. Application programs, sensors in trucks, news reports, traffic, weather, sports outcome, police, and other emergency channels, and so forth. The cognitive node has several objectives. It optimizes to depend, you know, depending on the situation, the emergency, the store traffic patterns, uh, changing labor and stocking plans, new vendor promotions. You know, so it's re-optimizing store in, you know, in-store advertising models and so forth. Its goal is to optimize to a profit or minimize an expense. So there's various scenarios and models used to predict optimal possible outcomes and to generate an appropriately optimized action plan, you know, constantly being revised. The outcome performance is typically improved with better math and you know, situational data and additional context. In a grocery store, many things are going on simultaneously. There's never enough resources to deal with every situation in a timely manner. Store managers are always making decisions about the next best action based on a wide variety of multimodal signals. Cognitive systems is about helping them make decisions, but it's also about making decisions for them because they make it faster than they can. So let's look at this layered together. Higher functioning cognitive systems are you know, like this one. This is what we did for the uh, virtual store manager. It's a, it also is one we use for AI cyber defense systems. You know, any uh, highly intelligent learning system. They're made of layers of cognitive managers bounded by rules of engagement. Rules of engagement are where you're, you're telling it, this is your, your authorities that I give you to operate within. Things you can't do, things you can do. Informed by information nets, uh, informed by a higher level AI managers, and they operate in this, this continuous set of loops. Now, the thing that uh, I want you to see through all of this is they all have a different set of functions. And that's the way we break down the complexity. We have sensors and information uh, operational systems that are constantly gathering and looking at the data and picking up things, making decisions from these the uh, things that you saw in this prior slide. 
they're all made up of a variety of things that you saw here. This is just an explode out of a small set of many of these that are just bounded together to do checkout assistant, fraud detection, security production, planning, and so forth. All coming together and then reorchestrated to achieve to achieve a much higher outcome. You may be surprised that a grocery store would have so many uh, pieces of information and so many things to do, but that's the complexity of any organization. And we we minimize the complexity our humans deal with by getting all this information of relevant data and taking care of it for them within within these AI, AI systems, so that the human can really focus on the things that it takes a human to do. That's really the power of AI. So let's, let's get a kind of an idea of what a continuous process might look like with uh, contextual referencing added into it. So this is a sense and response system. They're inside these loops that uh, I just discussed. You just saw in this prior slide. So uh, new observation. In this case, let's say it's a person coming out of a store that's the observation space is the thing that you're trying to observe. Now I'm gonna bring it back up and show that there was something that we then abstracted from the observation space through a camera, through a sensor, a door, a receipt, anything. But, but that event is the yellow puzzle piece with the little star on it. That's the thing I'm a uh, new observation. The puzzle pieces that you see already put together, the green, the red, the blue, the yellow, the brown, are all the puzzle pieces that have been identified with this customer uh, before, and they're already contextually referenced. Prior history, prior things. Now, when we have identified that observation space that belongs to that customer in this case, we call that data, that's data finding data. That observation found the puzzle, this customer, that it belonged to. Then it has to make a decision. Do I know enough to, to, to accurately put it into context within this contextual store? These are typically no, uh, no SQL Rose stores, by the way. Then it makes a decision. Ah, you know, I really want to know something else to really snap it in place well. So it knows other sensors that it has. So it makes a decision on what sensor it wants to activate to get some more information. Perhaps this wasn't this was a, a video thing that it picked out and took uh, an observation and it wants the receipt. So it asks for the receipt. And there, that with that piece of uh, data, it then was able to snap that, that uh, prior observation in place. But here comes that, re that uh, receipt. And now these relevance, this uh, human directed attention, these, uh, these other folks you see in the, in the directed attention box, they've registered uh things that they want to know tell me when there are pink elephants on the white house lawn don't tell me uh don't tell me that until it exists so they re they registered things they wanted to know that when true let me know so i'm gonna just stay over here do my thing when all these other conditions are true and this condition happened this thing occurred a uh, hurricane in the gulf whatever it is you let me know then these are the things that i find interesting Guess what? That blue puzzle piece made something interesting happen. So they were told this unique condition you want to know about just occurred. Now, deep reflection. Have you ever sit in a couch and then you're um, watching a show and all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, Harry at work loves Sally. Uh, I was just watching a ball game and it just popped into my mind. Harry loves Sally. Oh my goodness. That's deep reflection. You're doing data mining in the back of your, your mind. You're just scrubbing all these facts in the back and all of a sudden some things snapped, in, snapped into place and you realize that those things collectively meant Harry must love Sally. Well, that's what we also do in these systems. We're doing data mining in the back and we bring those data pieces into context for some, for some uh, non-obvious relationships. And in this case, that snapped in a new pattern. That new pattern was then informed that group of folks, those people go, that's so interesting. I love that. Wow. I'm going to register a brand new interest that if it becomes true, let me know. So now we've expanded our interest. So if I look at this, this first element, it's extract is normally done in a streaming mode, but can be done in batch. 
This is MT resolution and relationship discovery. This is machine learning data mining components. And also deep learning can live here. And this is gra graph visualization, case management, and so forth. Scoring predictive modeling, the processing live back in this uh, decision side. And that is that loop. Now, I'm going to quickly rotate to identity duality and insider threat. So I'm going to take these things we just talked about that can run stores and make profit and so forth. And I'm going to use them again. That intelligent enterprise, they've got to understand about security. So let's talk about that real quick. In identity duality, insider threat, security questions. Quick little definition. You see all four. I'm only going to talk about two. One of them is duality. Well, what is duality? It's two things that can be opposite at the same time. I'm a trusted employee. I'm also an insider threat. A Kuritsu, uh, normally associated with doing business in Japan, but you see that um, uh, you see the definition I have on the screen. But it's the thing that I want you to 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 really snap to. It's secret relationships. It's relationships not out in the open. Things you don't know reveal themselves and surprise you. You don't like surprises. In security, you don't like surprises. Bad things. So what I want to talk about a moment is how these, uh, these bad things can happen. So let's go back to 2014, Guardians of Peace. Y'all remember that story about uh, Sony being hacked? That wasn't any fun, was it? Any that story really cause you some problems? Let's, let's think about it a second. Hackers not only got in and erased its systems, they got into its computer infrastructure using a, a, a virus, some malware. They stole approximately 100 terabytes of sensitive Sony data. That's a lot of data. Then they started gradually releasing that data to the public. It included um, pre-release movies, people's private information, sensitive documents. They released documents such as employee salaries and bonuses, HR performance reviews. Oh yeah, and we're getting sensitive. Criminal background checks, termination records, correspondence about employees' medical conditions. You know, these tactics were aimed at demoralizing Sony's employees and causing them internal instability. It was to instilling fear in Sony's employees and reducing their productivity. This was intentional to cause reputational harm and deter celebrities from working with Sony due to fear about possible leaks. Now, if you remember, that was uh, because of, uh, uh, as it was later, you know, hindsight, it, it was associated with a, a country's uh, a disdain for a movie that Sony was going to release. All right, so that occurred. Let's go back to something else. Uh, 2015, Anthem uh, disclosed criminal hackers had broken into its servers, stole approximately 80 million health records, personally identifying data. Okay, not good. Now, let's think about this a minute. Think about the college information that was, has been stolen. Think about all these other things that have been stolen, those things being correlated. Now, ask yourself this question. What if we had all this information from all these leaks correlated together and you've got this wonderful employee? And they get a phone call and they know exactly how to get to your employee. No past behavior of any sort of any bad things happening. This guy was the model of perfection. But he says, I'm going to do this to your kids. I'm going to do this to your wife. I know you don't care about yourself if you don't do this one little bitty thing for me. And they do this to nine employees who this one little bitty, you know, small little thing that that person goes, well, that's not that bad. And then you add them all together and it's something huge, but they knew how to get to them. Suddenly you have a terrible situation. They just let massive company harm get out, but each one individually didn't think they were doing much harm at all. So they didn't see that it was that bad, but you actually put them together. It was huge. So what happens if past behavior is not an indicator of future behavior? Then you need a zero trust security model. 
And the way that you figure these things out is you've got to collect up all these little, little small little hints that are happening in your security system. You need a sense and response system. You've got to be able to go figure out all the slightest little bitty hints about what's going on in your system, and you've got to change. You've got to change the way you do security. These same systems I'm talking about equally applicable here. Let's talk about duality. All of these things, all these pictures about duality. Picture of Dorian Gray, duality. Remember that story. A colonialist, duality. I'm a loyal citizen. I am also revolutionary. Counterfeit goods, duality. I'm one but the other. Blue on gray. I'm your I'm your your buddy. I'm with you. I'm fighting with you, but I'm not. The minute I get into battle, I kill you too. You didn't know I really wasn't with you. Now, I want to go to this, and we're going to go to a poll in a minute. On Saturday, February the 1st, 1997, a fire destroyed most of ASIN's, the ASIN company's capability. It's 23% owned by Toyota Motor Company, their number one factory, which did all of Toyota's brake assemblies. This was bad. It shut down the plant, shut down Toyota. Oh, my goodness. Toyota had two suppliers. However, 99% of their P valves that were critical for every car they manufactured came from ASIN. Humongous impact. Shut Toyota down. It was terrible. It was so bad that Toyota's production hall would lead to an un unacceptable decrease in Japan's total industrial output. Now, I want you to. This is bad, terribly bad. They've got to recover from this. While we bring up a poll and you vote on what Toyota did after, you know, to mitigate this, I'm gonna read you a little bit more about it. So bring up the Toyota poll. To avoid this undesirable outcome, Toyota and Asin called upon members of their Karitsu. They just, they just said, we just need help, broadcast it on TV. Without anything other than this, we need help. This is what happened. 36 suppliers, aided by more than 150 subcontractors, instantly, separately, without communicating with each other, fired up, fired up separate production lines, with each production line outputting small batches of the PVOM. So this was done by family affiliation, you know, debts of gratitude, non-obvious other relationships. Nobody could have mapped it out. Nobody knew what they were. Brother sewing machine, a sewing machine. Was a family member, had a family member three times removed. They created the valve, although they were terribly inefficient, terribly terrible cost. Cost Toyota meant. But Toyota, without any permissions from anybody, they paid everyone who helped them. They paid their costs, their lost revenue, their retooling. They paid $100 million worth of bonuses. No receipts required. Their word was all that they required. They finally got up. They got things repaired. But this was at a terrible, terrible cost. So my question to you is, what did Toyota do to make for to, um respond to this massive fire and this obvious single uh, reliance on this single supplier. So what they do? Where are we at in the poll? Everybody figured out what they got? Government insurance, three alternative suppliers, they had two, but 99% bounce them out. 40% uh, devoted so far. I'm, okay, I'll give you 30 seconds. Three percent of Japan's GMP devastated. A lot of risk. Businesses do risk management. I'm gonna give you ten seconds, and then I'm gonna give you the answer. Got to pick five, four, three, two, one. Let me see the results. What do we got?
Yes, you know, you would have thought that they would have gone back to three alternate suppliers. 13 of you said they'd go back to what it was. That's a surprise. Six for government insurance. And 21, to make sure they had another alternate supplier other than them. They went back to exactly the way it was because their data showed that they could depend on that Karitsu to come bail them out again. And the cost savings were so much and was such a differential activity for them, such a differential uh, benefit that, uh, that that was good enough. They, they would risk it and depend on their Karitsu. Data is power. And that's what their data showed for them. They could depend on it. Now, I'm going to ask another data question. And I'm trying to advance the slide. All right. And I want to bring the poll up for the American Revolutionary War. So you bring that poll up, if you will. And I'm going to talk about it because we're all experts. We all know what happened in the American Revolutionary War. So I'm going to ask you this question. Consider it. Which one of these things that if it didn't happen would have prevented the American Revolutionary War? And we have the answer. It is one of those four. Data tells the story. I want to show you the, the impact of data. We have all the records from the past. We have, we have pounded those records. We've used network science nodes interacting in an ecosystem upon each other to go look at this and i want to see how good you are you you know uh you've been through classes you've been through college you've been through at least high school american history and the answers are there it's written down in the history books you've seen the specials we did a study we looked at it all and it and the data was overwhelming As a matter of fact the history channel uh in their uh, in their special on the Revolutionary War, made note of this. Yeah, I want to and I want to describe a model I'm going to show you. So we're going to take 30 seconds here and let you let you vote. Consider it. I'm going to show you a model where inurement factors. There are factors that are irritates. A three-dimensional model. Inurement factors are, fat, are factors that irritate you. They create a feeling of frustration. But it's items you'll deal with and and you'll accept. Constrainments are factors that constrain your freedom of action in a very material degree, and they change your abilities to provide an acceptable lifestyle. Uh, and in the middle of our, my model will show uh, insider threat activity. And uh, you can always see insider threat and understand as a, as a window of, of various power players and how they're reacting with each other. Uh, so we included uh, land sales, legal activities, um, every kind of what seemingly would be insignificant data. Now, remember what the Navigation Act was, uh, England's um, uh, American colonies could only export their data to English on English ships. They basically just enriched uh, England. Uh, Remember uh, uh, pine trees? The pine trees were, uh, uh, that's England's ability to build ships. And uh, there's only two kinds of uh, pines, two kinds of trees. One of them was to um, uh, be the masts. And they had to be very, very special trees. And Britain had already cut down all their trees. Uh, Spain had the others. And the American colonies had the, the white pine, which was the very specific tree needed. Now, as we look at the poll, the Boston Massacre, yes. Quartering Act, I'm putting people in your house and spying on you. Navigation Act, you only use my ships. 21% of you picked the White Pines Act. So, well, let's go, let's go look. Let's go look at the model and get the data, and then we'll summarize. So let's, uh, let's go past that, bring the model up. This is one that uh, uh, was done with Dr. Chan. There we go, I'm gonna go back. And you already saw the special. Here's the model and the um, that has the ways we just talked about that uh, latent stability model and uh, it's it's uh, the the data and the method is good that the um, State Department uh, was using using this to uh, 
the, the method and the, the thought process to uh, help predict um, uh, you know, future Arab Spring events. Uh, and as I get ready to go to summary, I will just uh, bottom line this because you already saw the other, other slide, but uh, as you get to red and then white, uh, white uh, lighter colored, that is the, the uh, intensity of uh, insider threat. But as you rack and stack the data and you look for what the thing is that ignited it, that if I removed it, we would then still have anger but not revolution it is and the drum roll was the white pines act uh now they really needed those pines because they were the only other tree that would fit for those big masks that were on the uh british ships and they really needed them very badly for their navy so when the royal governor sir john wentworth decided to enforce the uh the pine tree law that was done in, 19, in 1722, he enforced it, uh, as you can see on that chart, in uh, 1776, 1775 is when he was governor and he enforced it within that time frame. That is what was the straw, the domino that started the other dominoes, that if you had pulled that out, that would have, have uh, uh, diffused the American Revolution so the question is, how much do you think King George III would have paid to know this? The value of data, the value of these systems. So here's the, pun, here's the uh, first principles line. Winning takes teamwork. The key point here is it's not a consensus game when you're doing transformation and you're doing things that must integrate with each other. You have to have somebody with decision rights. These things have got to integrate together. It's, it's enterprise architecture, it's a variety of other things, interacting with your data program or AI programs and so forth. Um, the other thing that I will uh, uh, bring up to you is the uh, third from the bottom, is that this, uh, the cognitive complexity conundrum is a system of system solution. The, uh, the next second from the bottom is do not split up your data science analytic and BI programs. Use them as pipelines. They have to be coordinated together. If you're gonna get uh, 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 streaming systems, you've got to, this data is, program is, is vital to you. And if you're gonna look at the, Latin, the last one is the value of a cloud native security program. Do not do this bespoke. You will fail. It's not gonna work for you. And uh, I'm just going to give you a half a second uh, to uh, also absorb the context computing must be mastered for edge compute and prediction. Uh, it's, you, you have to do it. You're going to have to get good at it. Uh, these things are integral or you will sputter and spat and your whoever got it, whoever gets these will then beat you in business if they're your competitor. So these bullets are part of mastering the tools of disruption. And with that, I'm going to close and uh, we're gonna go to Q&A and I would like you to ask Dan very, very, very difficult questions, please. Now, why would he say that? <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, Dan, Dan or Wes, we're going to ask you to stop sharing your presentation at this point. If you can click on the stop sharing presentation button. Uh, Dan, great to have you here. We have uh, we are just one minute from uh, from the scheduled time, so we'll be we'll, I'll, I'll go through the questions here uh, on the uh, as uh, quickly, and we we'll maybe do do one or two. Um, Jonathan asked Dan if you could flesh out the transformation timeline at Kroger. What did the business transformation timeline look like at Kroger? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to say it's done because I, I really do believe that transformation within a large corporation is a continuous process. Our customers are changing, our business models are changing. COVID has changed our business model dramatically. If people don't want to go in the grocery store. We have to be make sure that we have a great customer experience while we protect the safety of our customers and the safety of our associates. So uh, I, I don't think there's a begin there's a beginning and end, quite honestly. If the world but is if, not stuck. If you could just uh, give us some sight on, uh, you know, um, have you gone through a transformation process in the organization where 
maybe five years ago, this started becoming, uh, you know, as a strategic direction that you took. Uh, is this something that you have done in the last 12 months? Uh, just just a rough timeline on uh, on when you started down this this path that you share with us. Uh, it's it's probably in uh, a couple of years since couple of years. ideation okay. and thought processes and so forth. And I and I will say we're done. Very good. Another question, Cameron was asking about, uh, he said it was a great example of cognitive, cognitive system for a grocery store, and he was curious about um, if you take into consideration pricing and promotions as a factor on the, on the, on the model for the grocery store that you showed. Hey, Dan, well, let me, let me, let me grab ahead. that one. That is just one of a ton of other considerations we did not put in the put in the uh, in the model because we did not want to show all that. Uh, but just think of uh, every consideration that is important to a customer or optimizing a customer experience uh, or a differentiator that we wish to add to the experience. You can continuously change or or move those onto that. It's just another no consideration you add as long as you have the data that streams in. Very good, very good. And one last one here from uh, from Jonathan um, the, on the virtual store manager. Uh, he is asking, can this cognitive tool be automated to run as a single bot, or or is it already? Uh, I'll answer that one. Uh, you could. That wouldn't be advisable because then it's difficult and complex to change. So. So here's just kind of one of the resilience factors you want to do is put architectural boundaries in capabilities. So when you get into uh, uh, the kind of programming to where you're changing and automating uh, many, 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 many capabilities, the way you reduce complexity is make functions uh, so, uh, self-contained. So now I can go in and update that function without impacting many other functions. So that allows me to do like you would see on your phone where you can go and have have all these different changes to the phone and see them updating daily or once a week and uh, you do so uh, instead of having this uh, every six month release if you put them all together you're going to you're going to have this one humongous release that has got a lot of risk to it so that's a, also a risk management uh, method is to make them highly specialized and highly componentized very well Wes and Dan, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your experience and a wonderful journey that Kroger has been on with all of us today. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, thanks to you. And thanks to everyone and your audience and your sponsors. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this will finish this portion of our session. Uh, a couple of reminders for you as you uh, close out of the session close the box for the webinar and there will be a, a, a close button that if you click on there will be a short survey um, and any feedback that you have regarding the session you can enter it there. Um, we have on June 23rd through June 25th we have IBPM live uh, that will be the next event for the business transformation operational excellence uh, live summits so um, uh, you can register for that at ibpmlive.online ibpmlive.online and uh, it will have a, a terrific uh, sessions with uh, amazing hosts um, amazing speakers on very practical uh, applications for intelligent bpm specifically um, so we're going to be finishing up this session. I'll see you at the top of the hour, five minutes to the top of the hour. We'll restart the session and uh, we'll have Marco Chimura, Director of Quality and Transformation at Morningstar, talking to us about controlling your robots, how you design an effective RPA governance program for a large financial services organization. So you do not want to miss that. I will see you in a little bit. Thank you.